Welcome to Inside Art Podcast, where you will get to see through the eyes of artists who transform our understanding of the world. Join me for this personal investigation of the artist's relationship to inspiration, art making, and flow. For this episode, I speak with artist Rodrigo Valenzuela, who lives in Los Angeles and makes incredible work based in photography, sculpture, and installation. He's also the head of the UCLA photography program, and we talk about capitalism and workers, notions of landscape and belonging, as well as his commitment to giving a younger generation of artists a sense of confidence to express themselves and succeed. I hope you enjoy. The following is a video clip from this episode. And so this show that we're looking at now called Journeyman, uh, I found it to be really unique in terms of your installation approach. Um, it's really cool. It's so you've got your photographs on the wall and then the entire gallery floor is raised, made of plywood with these inserted boxes. And what's in the boxes, these sculptures? Uh, some ceramic pieces I made. Um, yeah, I thought it was something interesting about um, listen, listen some, for simple sounds, like listen to your steps when you walk inside a place or like making or make an installation that you look down literally looking down at something um, where you have to really be aware of your body. I mean, if you have seen all the installations uh, from going around a structure or seeing a scaffolding, or so feeling your steps, I like to f- the light that the viewer can be aware of their body, that they walk inside a place and now they are participants of that yeah, vantage point and looking and thinking and moving around and the way they move around, right? The works in the wall, they are photographers. They are like this pre-making process that they are, you know, so you, you see the indentation of the paper in the paper and then you see that it's almost like a photo, but it has this graphite looking mm-hmm. elements. Um, it's one of the first ways to reproduce images so i really wanted to feel the weight of all the work this is actually the second um, part of the trilogy of modernism where i was thinking about uh, latin american brutalism and the buildings and all the modernist buildings built during the during the 50s and 60s in latin america coincidentally when all the countries have dictatorships so in my mind i was like Mm, the CIA and they were all sponsored by the CIA. There was this place in Panama called the, the School of the Americas. Now is well, there also was this place in, in Fort Benning in in Atlanta. Um, that was part of this the School of the Americas, basically where most dictators in Latin America got trained. And it got a bump after the, the Vietnam War to really um elevate the the anti-communist um agenda so mm. um a lot of the a lot of the countries um i mean this, the place been running since 1948 so it wasn't um uh, they were running this really school for assassins for a long time mm. and a lot of the dictatorships in bolivia and chile argentina Paraguay, uh, Peru, they were most of these people were trained in American educational system. Not surprisingly. So, so they are um, so I was thinking a lot about the brutalism in that in, during that period, like the co- the the coincidence between um this modernist architecture and the CIA. Uh, putting dictators all over Latin America. So I started making these statues, please, these pieces that they were kind of little monsters uh, slash like monuments. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I mean, that is a little, my little devil, right? So, so yeah, I made a lot of random objects with, um, and uh, they were all made out of concrete. And again, thinking a lot of, when I work, when I move here, I work as a concrete worker. So I, I know how to use concrete very well. And I, and I was just feeling this styrofoam packaging that I found in the street with concrete and making these little monuments 
out of the byproduct of capitalism in some, in some way. So it's a lot of material mix between the history of Latin America and brutalism and and just and just kind of like using this capitalist afterthoughts to build monuments. It's incredible. Yeah. Were you thinking this at the time or did you kind of realize it as you went along and like I usually start with a pretty solid foundation, but I do not know everything about it. I know that about the dictatorships, I know I don't know the shapes, you know. So okay. one that gave me like a lot of freedom because I, I, you know there's some images that would remind me of this sculpture there, this sculpture there. I obviously reach out into a lot of like other images and other ideas, but in general, like the research is there. Uh, I just don't know the shapes and and I just start playing around. Yeah. Oh, it's really magical. It's like, it's so heavy and so disturbing what you're talking about. And um, I see the connection, but it's like, because you're making art and you're creating your own um, experience, and then we get to experience that in our own way, that there's just so much more room in there. It's like a novel, you know, it's both, both fictional and real on so many yeah ways. i think i you know it's funny i, lo- I love thinking a lot about that um and that the word real and really thinking about um, i know real is just like it's like i don't have a better word than that Fiction, no it, no i think oh, it's maybe it's, historical <laughs> but even yeah, that they, even I that mean, has so many versions yeah i think is um i mean there's flaws in everything right i mean and but we do not have better words for a lot of stuff. And the thing with uh and 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 photography has this very interesting friction with reality, right? I truly I I say it as a like kind of like jokey, a slightly sassy statement about like a lot of uh photography that is immediate, like street photography is kind of like a the Republican cousin of, phot- of photography, right? And I, and, and I make this very weirdly liberal work or like um, a slower, like Zen in the way that, you know, I think because photography has this relationship with the real, so many times we associate that the real with immediacy. And we see it even with politicians, right? Where the person that says something really fast is is felt or recorded as real, as more real, right? Keeping it real is saying stuff from the guts, right? Saying what you think is keeping it real, right? And it's very, very silly because in some way taking some time away and truly meditating about it and really thinking and responding tomorrow with a definitive answer with what you really met yeah, is suddenly encountered as less real than that immediate and process emotional response and um, and we leave the whole society like that and i think it's really fucked up <laughs> yeah i feel like uh you i read somewhere that you went for a degree in philosophy is that right or something yeah. you did postgraduate yeah. work no not post- i was undergrad at, at the, uh, the undergrad- state college and so i don't know how to ask this i just heard that in what you were saying <laughs> I heard a philosopher just thinking like well, always big picture, like why why are we doing it this way? Um I love yeah. the way you think. I think it's a it's a I mean it's um yeah, I think it's 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 a funny way of um that we have to like not get better at thinking through issues and like really um, prioritizing immediacy. Or not really, um, again, it's like also the, the not having fear to be wrong. Make mistakes. Like, you know, make mistakes and be... Converse. And just like, yeah, I think thinking out loud doesn't have anything. Like, I, I mean, even if you say the wrong thing, no one accuses you of being dumb, right? There's certain, there's a lot of other components into like, you know, uh, being wrong, you know, you may that is different than uh, saying something that is not smart or like something you haven't really need more time to think through. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I think it's it's a very complicated relationship we have with reality and immediacy, and um, and really, I mean, also artists have so much mm-hmm. fucking time to think about the stuff, and they spend so some, some painters just takes months in making one painting. So like, it's really like this whatever people call philosophy or really thinking through issues. It is a lot of time to kind of muscle some thoughts and really kind of like clean and dissect and really like um, um, elaborate a very robust discord. But, um, but you know, we have this weird society where like intellectuality is in opposition to conceptuality, conceptualism, right? So we don't even consider it like very heartfelt emotional components of art intellectually driven. And in the same way that you don't want something very intellectually also be you give you with very too many emotions, right? Um it's some grad school stuff or maybe college or maybe like a Western European Germanic influence that taught you about this that the smart things have to be cold. But I really think is um you know when you think something, you feel something. When you feel something, you think something. And there is not, there is no reason. Mostly in the speed that artists work, well, everything takes so fucking long. Nobody asks you to make a, a painting in an hour. Nobody asks you to make a show in two days. You have so much time to really meditate about the shit that you're making and why you're making it. That is not sharing those feelings. It's a lack of, it's a missed opportunity. Mm-hmm. I wanted to ask you, what are your dreams? And uh, it's a it's a weird question, right? Like, I felt like I should ask you some really technical questions about uh, art. No, please it's not. Weird. I would hate that. But I felt well, like I will hang you, out. the only yeah. question that I really wanted to know, like, so what are you dreaming about? Like, what do you want to, if you could do anything, what would you do? You know, because you're such a hard worker. <laughs> yeah, I you know, I mean, have a dream. I dream have side to, to you. I think it's a nice question. I think I have to work hard on not let my identity to be so wrapped up in the idea of being a hard worker. Because I do, like, you know, I mean, I moved here without nothing, with nothing, like no money, no English, nothing. You know, so it doesn't happen often that people that cross the border walking and doesn't have any friends or family or money yeah. end up being... A uh, tenure professor at a uh, best university, having amazing colleagues and having a lot of economic stability, and pretty successful art career. I mean, it's oh, really I'm, amazing. I'm glad that you think that. Um, yeah, I but, do. Uh, I, you know, so so the the I do have to. I mean, I dream with finding this balance where I don't think that. I'm a bad person if I'm not working all the time, if I'm not helping my students, if I'm not. But, you know, I don't even consider helping my students. And really, for most of these people, are so smart. And I would talk about that with anybody, anytime, all the time, you know. Um, and sometimes to a fault where I give a lot, I don't have a lot of space to really think through my own life and issues. And, you know, so I, I yeah, I wanted to find time for, um, uh, break the meat with my friends or my colleagues that I have no life and I just work really hard. And then people only introducing me as like, this Rodrigo, super hard worker guy. You know, I do have this fantasy since I was a kid to be smart. I do maybe because I grew up so poor that I, I always thought that through intellectual life, I could, doesn't mean that I could be rich, but at least I could not be concerned about money because I could be happy reading a book and like, or watching a movie. So, but that is like kind of like the early thought I have memory is like that, like I, maybe because I saw my grandpa reading a lot and I, the only kind of male figure I had that was to admire uh, was somebody that was like very intellectually driven. So I always thought that that would be a good way to escape, but not only poverty, but just escape, right? So, um, Right now, I mean, I am really interested in teaching in the way that um, that is more gratifying to have good students and to have a meaningful dialogue 
with them than a lot of shows. And definitely having a, an hour with some students is much more gratifying than have a studio visit with a fancy curator. I think um, teaching years and years of undergrads and grads at UCLA and many schools. I mean, this summer I'm going to go to teach at bar. I do at least like 10 schools a year teaching and doing, I just was two weeks ago at SBA in, in New York before I was at University of Iowa. And I do it so much. I, next week, in two more weeks, I went to UPenn. Uh, so between doing studio visits and talks, I think I my art or my art, my art ideas make a bigger impact than being in any biennial documenta or anything. I mean, you don't remember who the fuck was in the 2012 Whitney Biennial. Like it's just irrelevant in your life. But having a really good teacher, a good mentor, somebody that is like really have you back and really give you critical feedback is will stay with you for like 30 or 40 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, your teachers um, never leave your mind, do they? So um, I think it's, you- I think that makes me really, really happy. And that is like what I hope is like try to become a better teacher and and, um, and a good ally for these people that are trying to figure out because art, art is a lot of like this like uh you know it's almost like karate in some way right like you when you enter the room like everybody's together trying to kick the really high right the white bells and the black bells are kind of all together and you do the same exercise and doesn't get it's not much complicated than that really thinking through images talking about culture poetics and politics and sometimes suddenly you get really good. And that's a point in age where a lot of people get really bad after being so good for so long because just, just you bad, you know, and it shit happened. But it is, it is, I, I really am all interested in making interesting work that I want to talk and think a lot about it. But teaching is super, super important because it's just, yeah, I don't, I don't, I can't think of anything more important in the art world than like, and like giving confidence to people to express themselves and to be the better, the best self and really enabling self-discovery. Yeah. That's amazing. You sound like an idealist. I, I couldn't teach school when I first got out of art school because I just couldn't, I, I felt like I wouldn't be able to face myself if I told all these students they should go and become artists. I just, I was in such questioning of the whole process that like, how the hell am I going to make a living? I can't in good, conscience tell this young person that they should make a living you know obviously i don't feel that way now but what do you yeah, tell your students it's, that- it's tough because you know we try to make it as affordable as can be the school right i try to give them tools to be able to apply to stuff and to know when they're doing something wrong when they're doing something right uh, there is obviously recipes and techniques to for professionalization of this thing right but the main thing is like um, it's how to think through issues, and I think the art thoughts will help you, or like some techniques will help you through life and through issues and through like many different things, you know. Thank you for listening to this episode of Inside Art Podcast. You can connect with me at sarahroster.com or at Inside Art Podcast on Instagram.